Practical Vedanta Part 4 Text 3 This tendency in religion is most harmful. A man gets a new and better idea and then he looks back on those he has given up and forthwith decides that they were mischievous and unnecessary. He never thinks that, however crude they may appear from his present point of view, they were very useful to him, that they were necessary for him to reach his present state, and that every one of us has to grow in a similar fashion, living first on crude ideas, taking benefit from them, and then arriving at a higher standard. With the oldest theories, therefore, the Advaita is friendly. Dualism and all systems that had preceded it are accepted by the Advaita not in a patronizing way, but with the conviction that they are true manifestations of the same truth and that they all lead to the same conclusions as the Advaita has reached. With blessing and not with cursing should be preserved all these various steps through which humanity has to pass. Therefore, all these dualistic systems have never been rejected or thrown out, but have been kept intact in the Vedanta. And the dualistic conception of an individual soul, limited yet complete in itself, finds its place in the Vedanta. According to dualism, man dies and goes to other worlds and so forth. And these ideas are kept in the Vedanta in their entirety. For with the recognition of growth in the Advaita system, these theories are given their proper place by admitting that they represent only a partial view of the truth. From the dualistic standpoint, this universe can only be looked upon as a creation of matter or force, can only be looked upon as the plot of a certain will. And that will, again, can only be looked upon as separate from the universe. Thus, a man from such a standpoint has to see himself as composed of a dual nature, body and soul, and this soul, though limited, is individually complete in itself. Such a man's ideas of immortality and of the future life would necessarily accord with his idea of soul. These phases have been kept in the Vedanta and it is therefore necessary for me to present to you a few of the popular ideas of dualism. According to this theory, we have a body, of course, and behind the body is also made of matter, only very fine. It is the receptacle of all our karma, of all our actions and impressions, which are ready to spring up into visible forms. Every thought that we think, every deed that we do, after a certain time becomes fine, goes into seed form, so to speak, and lives in the fine body in a potential form, and after a time, it emerges again and bears its results. These results condition the life of man. Thus, he molds his own life. Man is not bound by any other laws excepting those which he makes for himself. Our thoughts, our words and deeds are the threads of the net which we throw around ourselves for good or for evil. Once we set in motion a certain power, we have to take the full consequences of it. This is the law of karma. Behind the subtle body lives jiva or the individual soul of man. There are various discussions about the form and the size of this individual soul. According to some, it is very small like an atom. According to others, it is not so small as that. According to others, it is very big and so on. This jiva is a part of that universal substance and it is also eternal. Without beginning it is existing and without end it will exist. It is passing through all these forms in order to manifest its real nature which is purity. Every action that retards this manifestation is called an evil action. So with thoughts. And every action and every thought that helps the jiva to expand to manifest its real nature is good. One theory that is held in common in India by the crudest dualist as well as by the most advanced non-dualist is that all the possibilities and powers of the soul are within it and do not come from any external source. They are in the soul in potential form and the whole work of life is simply directed towards manifesting more potentialities. They also have a theory of reincarnation 
which says that after the dissolution of this body, the jiva will have another and after that has been dissolved, it will again have another and so on, either here or in some other worlds. But this world is given the preference as it is considered the best of all worlds for our purpose. Other worlds are conceived as of worlds where there is very little misery, but for the, that very reason they argue. There is less chance of thinking of higher things there. As this world contains some happiness and a good deal of misery, the jiva sometime or other gets awakened, as it were, and thinks of freeing itself. But just as very rich persons in this world have the least chance of thinking of higher things, so the jiva in heaven has little chance of progress, for its condition is the same as that of a rich man, only more intensified. It has a very fine body which knows no disease and is under no necessity of eating or drinking, and all its desires are fulfilled. The jiva lives here having enjoyment after enjoyment and so forgets all about its real nature. Still there are some higher worlds where in spite of all enjoyments, its further evolution is possible. Some dualists conceive of the goal as the highest heaven where souls will live with God forever. They will have beautiful bodies and will know neither disease nor death nor any other evil and all their desires will be fulfilled. From time to time, some of them will come back to this earth and take another body to teach human beings the way of God. And the great teachers of the world have been such. They were already free and were living with God in the highest sphere. But their love and sympathy for suffering humanity was so great that they came and incarnated again to teach mankind the way to heaven.